1103, back at it. Dr. Payne Show. Phone lines 416 870 6400, star 640 on sale. You've got pain, you got issues. Bring them on. We'd love to hear from you. Your stories, your concerns. You have questions? 416 870 6400 star 640 on sale. You want to get a hold of uh, Dr. Payne outside of show hours, by the way. Info at paincarecanada.com. And. Or if you're scared, like Greg. Yeah. I can't believe he's that scared. Such a tough guy. I think anytime and, someone's yeah. like, quote unquote, going under the knife, they don't like it. I don't like going to the dentist, never mind getting knee surgery. I guess. I mean, I guess because I just. Those things are so routinely done now. I mean, like heart surgery, yeah, I'd be stressed too. I, <laughs> but knee surgery, I don't know. You know what the problem is? He's an active guy, so he's going to be. Out. I yeah. think the fact that he's out of commission scares him more than anything, right? Right. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, I guess that's. A yeah, good if you're point. a slob, you just sit around watching. You know, uh, I guess reruns that's what, of Gilligan's that's Island with TV dinners. <laughs> oh, well, I do my knee while I'm sitting here. I don't care. But if you know, if you're an active guy like Greg, you know, that's true. So, yeah. so what's up? Tell me a story, son. I, I got a story for you. It was an interesting story. It, it really highlights what I've talked about a million times, which is the the psychosocial component yep. of pain. Okay, so. Uh, without mentioning any names, I had a, a person that was referred to me. Um, he came in. Uh, I When I saw the referral, the family doctor sent it over. All I knew was when I get a referral from a family doctor, it'll just say something along the lines of um, patient has uh, such and such pain. They're on such and such medication. Here's a CT or whatever might be involved. Please assess. And, Pretty broad and recommend. Strokes. Yeah, that's that's the way referrals happen. So I get this, and I see that it's a person that has low back pain for about four months history. Um, they're on a bunch of different pain medications, haven't improved with conservative therapy, which means they were doing some type of physiotherapy and they didn't improve. Okay. And there was a, T- a CT scan of the low back that was uh, given to me. I looked at the CT scan. Um, there was nothing there that jumped out to me that I thought, okay, okay this kind of makes sense. It was this person's 59 years old. Everything that was on that CT scan was exactly what I would Expect out of the run of the mill fifty nine year old, nothing, not degeneration yeah, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. You see, life buddy, playing you should a part. Be doing this by yourself, yeah, you know no. now. Yeah, no. Um, and so, person comes in, and I'm in my office, sitting there in the waiting room. I'm here. Oh, oh like, like, just per- going on. Yeah, and my office manager comes in and just says, like, you need to come out here. And so I go out, and he just a total mess, like everything, like ah, like loud. You know, we. In the health industry, we'll call that a yellow flag. So red flags are things like, you know, if you hear a scary symptom, like someone's like, you know, I threw up blood or Mm -hmm. things that are like, "Mm, that should never really happen. Yellow flags are things that start to indicate amplification of pain, psychosocial issues. Like, you know, when someone, it's it's more than just simple mechanical stuff. Because I've met people that are in, in absolute pain and agony and they're not doing what this guy was doing. And But he was moving around just totally fine. So he was accompanied by his wife and his daughter. Okay. And um, so, you know, he filled out, they, they filled out the forms to the best of their ability. Then I got them in, got them all in the office and we started going through everything. And same thing. He was just like constantly like complaining and, and whatnot. So I asked him to calm down. I said, it's, it's very important, obviously, for us to get through this, that you're calm so that we can talk about it. I know you're in pain, but, you know, we have to try figuring this out. So he did. He finally calmed down. Um, we went through everything. We did. It was a very long history because I tried to get a sense of everything. Right. There were a couple of other history questions that I wanted to ask, and I'll and I'll go into them in a second. But before I did, I wanted to assess him because I wanted to see the extent of his function, which I talk about yep. a lot. So he his complaint was low back pain with shooting pains in his legs. So I gave him a thorough um, low back exam, including range of motion testing, orthopedic testing to stress different structures, and a full neurological exam because there's pain in his legs from, okay. he's describing nerve pain. And everything was perfectly fine. I mean, he could bend, he could touch his toes, albeit he was, you know, screaming and doing these things, but he was able to do it. Um, orthopedic testing was all fine. Uh, neurological testing, equally, everything was normal. He was d- able to discriminate sensations, had full strength. Everything was fine. So we went back into my office from the exam room. We sat down again. I was with his family. Um, and I said, you know, based on the physical exam and based on your CT scan, if I didn't see you and someone gave me these physical exam findings and gave me this CT scan, I'd say there's probably not much wrong with you, but obviously there's something going on. Because he's because, very vocal about yeah, it. Yeah, because you're... And I, then I went into my other questions because, I again, I needed to make sure based on the history. I had a sense from the beginning. Mm-hmm. I asked him just flat out, how stressed are you in life? 
And he was like, more stressed than you can ever believe. And I said, well, you know, talk to me. What's what's so stressful about life? And he started going into things. And sure enough, you know, without divulging his personal information, about four months ago, right when his pain got really, really bad, because he's had low back pain for a very long time, but four months ago is when this got really bad. I said, what happened four months ago? Was there something that happened? And sure enough, this family within my office just started fighting with one another. And apparently four months ago, some type of family issue happened where they're at each other's throats. Just absolutely. And they're like yelling at each other. Father, daughter. Yeah, just all yelling at each other. And, you know, and, and then the wife starts saying, you know, he's crazy. This is it's all in his head and his wife's and then his daughter's saying the same thing. And he's like, see why I feel this way. Look what I have to put. And I, I was like, OK, everybody well, calm down. down. Everybody needs to take it down. And then I just basically said, I said, listen, what, what you need, you don't have a physical problem. Yep. You have a low back, a chronic low back ache, but it's at the intensity that it is because of how much it's being amplified. Mm-hmm. Um and also, who knows, maybe a little bit was also acting so that his wife and his daughter feel bad for him. I don't know. Sure, I, yeah, I, you know, um, and, you know, but I, sta- I sat there, I started to explain to them because they didn't, they didn't have an appreciation for this. How much your social life, because we talk about the psychological a lot, but how much your social life you bet. affects the way you will feel. And I said, and clearly there's a lot of dysfunction going on. Now, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't comment on what it is, how you should treat it. But I can tell you very much so that I see a problem here sitting in my office. Um, and, you know, and I had to explain to the wife and to the daughter that his pain doesn't mean that he's crazy. Me saying this stuff means that his brain is amplifying it because that's what happens. That's as real as it gets. Right. And then I had to explain to him how much controlling his anger, controlling his emotions would help him. And, you know, I talked to them for about 20 minutes about this stuff. And it was incredible. Within 20 minutes, he was sitting there saying, like, he was like, you're not going to believe this, but I already feel sort of better. I'm like, well, yeah, because you're starting out to put understanding to what's going on. I'm mm-hmm. like, you're able to bend. You don't have any neurological issues like you know, that's great. And you have pain. And and even if you could remove all the stress out of your life, you're still going to experience pain. But to the extent that it's at right now is not a physical problem. This wow. is a psychological problem. And, you know, I made the referral to the appropriate professional uh, to deal with that stuff. But it was incredible to see that change, you know, and, and it doesn't happen often where I can see a change that quickly in terms of psychosocial you stuff. Bet. But just talking about it already made an instant change. And, and it just, again, I mean, you can't look at pain without looking at the mind, the, the relationships in people's lives. And it's just so much more than just here it is. You point to a shoulder or it, you got to look at the whole person. More of that and your phone calls, comments, questions. Bring them on. 416-870-6400, star 640 on cell. Dr. Pain Show continues. Global News Radio, 640 Toronto. 1114, Dr. Payne Show, 416-870-6400, star 640 on cell. We'll get to more of your uh, stories. A day in the life of the clinic of Dr. Payne. It's a, uh, it's a good sitcom waiting to happen. Chris, we got oh, you on the line first. Show. I know Incredible. it would be so good. Hey, Chris, what's up, pal? How you doing? Good, sir. Um, my wife has a significant uh, lower back degeneration disease, and she's seen a specialist. And uh, they're recommending stem cell therapy, and I understand it's a relatively new therapy. I'm wondering if there's any side effects or risks that we should be um, looking into. Well, well, what do they what do they want to do the stem cells for? Like, what's the problem with the low back? It's a disc degeneration disease. Yeah. So, I mean, I think John knows this as well as I do at this point. Oftentimes, degenerative disc disease is not the reason for people's um, back pain. Uh, And it it really depends. I mean, that's not 100% of the time, but there needs to be something really significant going on in terms of degenerative disc disease, uh, and it needs to correlate with the person's symptoms. In terms of the stem cell, I it's it's too new. Uh, I don't really know anywhere that's really doing it outside of, unless you go to the States right now. Um, And I think there's better options, in all honesty, um, for trying to manage someone's pain now. And again, I'm, I guess to some extent, don't want to comment too much because I don't know enough about the stem cell therapy. Uh, but the research that I've seen on low back complaints and chronic issues um, never suggests. I, I mean, anytime something's new means we don't have the prognostic research on it to know what ends up happening because... A lot of these things, it's also about what happens in five years after it or 10 years after it. And and that's the stuff that we wouldn't know. We might have research right now that shows that 
It helps in regenerating something. But again, it's trying to line up whether the degenerative disc disease is the reason for the person's low back pain. And the stats on that, I mean, if you look at the research, it's 50-50, whether that's the case or it's not the case. So, you know, has your wife been properly assessed by somebody? Uh, Yeah, she's gone through the the x-rays and MRIs and has seen a specialist, like I said, um, who's trying to treat the pain. But again, he's, he's suggesting this therapy and he's also indicating that there are clinics in Toronto that now do it, which surprised me because I thought you were right that they only offered in the state. Yeah, I mean, I don't know for sure. I'm, I'm just, my most recent knowledge is that it wasn't. There may very well be now places that are doing it. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but again, I, I, I mean, if, I think you, it's, if you're wondering about it, you, you really have to talk to somebody who does that type of therapy, find out all the risks, the benefits, like what what is the intention? Like, what are you trying to do with the stem cell therapy? Um, are you trying to change the structure of the bones? Are you trying to help some t- type of tissue regenerate? And again, I, I just, I, I don't know enough about it. Has your wife done good rehabilitation for her low back pain? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and good rehab that she still continues to do day to day? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. The, the pain is still getting worse, though, over time. So. Okay. How old's your wife? Uh, 50. Yes, still young. Um, yeah, I mean, I, if those clinics exist, it might be worthwhile to go speak to them. I, I'm not sure. I don't. Again, I don't really want to comment because the the research that I know for low back pain, there's no recommendation for stem cell therapy. So I'm not really sure if that's something that I should be commenting on. Okay, thanks. Okay, no problem. Four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred star six forty and cell. We'll squeeze in another call before a break. Uh, Marcello, how are you? Good morning. Good. How are you? Thanks Good, sir. What's call. what's going on? I have uh, I have a severe uh, knee pain uh, for the last ten years. I used to be a jogger, so what happens when I, when this happens? You know, I start taking um, shark cartilage, and it seems to help. But uh, so I had, I had stopped jogging, and so uh, um, I started jogging again just a little bit, and now it's killing me. Okay, and have you ever had this knee looked at by anybody? Oh, I've had it looked at, but I never followed through with anything because it, 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 it would go away. But then it was so bad that even when if I laid down on the couch, I'd have to put it a certain way. And now it's like back, really. It kills, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this is something that I talk about a lot. The biggest thing with any of these things is the follow through as well. So, uh, I mean, if there are any time, I don't know what the issue with the knee is. Like, if I it's, think I might have some kind of torn ligament or something that's never really been um, diagnosed. Yeah, so I mean, I'd have to look at it um, and to be, to be certain, do an assessment on your knee, um, and we could try to figure out what the pain generating structure is. But I mean, uh, that, this is what I'm interested. Yeah, in. so I mean, the, give me a call one eight five 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 Doctor Lou one eight five 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 Doctor Lou D R L O U one eight five five yep five five yes Doctor Lou D R L O U Doctor Lou yeah man. Okay, great. And where where are you located? I do my assessments in Etobicoke, but there's I've got a provider network uh, throughout all of Ontario. So yeah, it, I have I have to take care of this because um, yeah, I'm 61 years old, but I'm very active. I go to the gym five times a week, and you know I'm I'm pretty good shape for my age, I think. But my knee's killing me. Yeah, you want to get it. You want to yeah, get I mean, on with it for yeah, sure. Yeah, we got to check it out. We yep. got to see what's potentially going on with it. And you know, one of the biggest things is, is trying to. You you said something there where you said if you really want to get back into running, but when you run, it hurts. We we you... Well, I started running, and it was okay. And then one day I woke up. Oh, mm-hmm. my God, it was killing me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so we, we have to figure out, is running something that should still be part of your life, um, or do we need to modify it somehow, or is there another acti- activity yeah, that may be better? Fine. If I can get rid of the pain. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and and one thing I never promise is that you know I could see somebody who's been has an issue for ten years and that we could completely eliminate it. Right. A lot of the times it's just a management issue. Yes, yes, okay. Um. But you know, let's take a look at it and let's see what comes of it. Okay. Great. I'll, I'll certainly give you a call. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate your call, Marcello. I see you there, John. We'll get to you as well. And your calls. Open lines four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred star six forty on cell at eleven twenty one. We continue. Doctor Payne Show, Global News Radio six forty Toronto. 11.23 on a uh, dismal Saturday. A good day to pick up the phone and get your uh, questions answered. If you have pain or any discomfort, not sure what it is, maybe you haven't been properly assessed, uh, give us a call here, 416-870-6400, star 640 on cell. It is info at paincarecanada.com to get a hold of Dr. Lou or one eight five 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 
Dr. Lou, D-R-L-O-U. I think next weekend as well, we're going to have uh, Dr. Gordon on talking about shockwave therapy, right? Correct, yep. yeah. That's yep. going to be a pretty interesting topic. Make sure you uh, you tune in for yep. uh, for that one as well. Got uh, John, thanks for hanging on the line, pal. How are you? Good, thanks, Dr. Lou. How are you? Good. I got uh, my grandma calling in for, uh, she's, being, she's uh, been disabled with a disease called diba- uh, diba- uh, diabetic macular edema. Okay. And uh, the specialist has recommended some sort of injection called uh, ranibizumab that they're going to inject in her eye. And uh, they're saying it's going to restore her vision mm. and get her back to uh, walking and whatnot. I uh, just want to get your input on it. Um, I don't think I'm the right co- person like to, to comment on any eye issues like that. I really don't deal with the eye actually at all. Um, in terms of diabetic macular uh, edema, it's it's swelling due to diabetes, um, and so it does need to be managed. I mean, if she's seeing someone who's an ophthalmologist and they've recommended it, uh, to become an ophthalmologist is one of the hardest subspecialties in medicine. Is it really? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, if that's something that they're recommending and they're telling you that it could restore their vision, again, I, I what I always encourage everybody is just continue to have that discussion yeah. with whoever the treating professional is because they're going to know the most. Now, I, I don't think anything could guarantee anybody could guarantee anything, but it's all about the stats, right? Like if, if someone's sitting there, like when we see somebody for a PRP injection for their knee and we're telling them, you know, there's a 75 percent chance that this will work within the three months. We're just giving them the reality based on numbers, uh, on the numbers, on the stats that we have. Now, the funny thing is most people don't care about stats because if, I mean, if you're part of the 76% or 75% that it works for, you're really happy. But if you're on the other end, it's like, Hey, I I don't care what the stats are. Even if it's 99 to one, if I'm that one, then that that sucks. Um, Dr. Lou, the, the optometrist has sent us to a retina specialist. Is that the same thing? Yeah, it would be an ophthalmologist. Yes. Gotcha. Okay, thanks for the input. Really enjoying your show. No problem. Thanks, John. I appreciate your call. I didn't realize ophthalmologists is such a uh, tough discipline. Yeah, well, they, you know, again, from what I understand, they they try, it's all, all the specialties are really based on supply and demand, too, so they don't overcrowd. Right. Um, so it's very, very tough to get into uh, because, you know, they might be any medical school or, or residency program may only be accepting one or two of mm-hmm. the of the medical students. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a tough one for sure. Um, but obviously very important. And I mean, when it comes to eyes, that is so specialized, oh, right? Like I, I feel confident, like obviously I deal with MSK issues, but if someone's talking to me about the heart, the GI system, the pelvis, like I feel comfortable enough based on my knowledge that the very least comment and, right. and I know the medicines and the surgeries and the things that are done for that. But when it comes to things like the eye, you know, like my job is like, if someone says, Hey, I'm, I've got an issue. Well, then you should go see a professional about that. Even the teeth, same thing. Like if you've got a, an issue going on, you got to go to a dentist. That's yeah. that's just all there is to it. But there's some things that are very, very specialized. I mean, we do deal with the eyes in terms of it's part of the vestibular system. So when people have things like dizziness balance and vertigo system. and balance issues, we try to rule out causes of the of the vestibular system and we'll do a screen for the eyes, but we're not going in depth. We're not prescribing anything for that like it's just really a matter of trying to identify is there some type of vision issue that could be leading to that type of vertigo dizziness which um you know happens a lot a lot of people get dizziness and vertigo and and those types of symptoms and you got to look at the vestibular system from the standpoint could it be the eyes could it be the ears um could it be uh the position sense of your head um and the neck like the way you rotate because you know, when you're rotating and talking and looking, that it all provides a sense. Down of, on a cell phone. Yeah, it all provides yeah. a sense of of where you are in real time, which is balance and coordination. Um, and sometimes things go off. Then there's parts of the brain, like the cerebellum, that control that. And so it's important to assess all of those things. And and we do often see that type of stuff. Uh, vertigo. I mean, a lot of vertigo. Um, Can that factor into the psychosocial as well? I mean, I think anything in healthcare yeah. can factor into the psychosocial. Like, you know, there's no research to suggest that stress causes this, for example. Like, right. you know, even if we picked, I don't know, cancer or whatever, there, I don't think we're going to find anything that says. But I think we could all agree that probably having too much stress doesn't help anything, sure. right? Um, and a lot of the things is is really based on the two-hit hypothesis that I've spoken about before, where it's kind of like... The thought is that you need some type of genetic predisposition and then some type of 
environmental trigger to, to trigger that gene expression. And that is what can lead to a lot of things. Um, and so, you know, genetics is genetics, and that's not something that we can change. No. Uh, but obviously our environment is something that we can change. And now there's nothing to say that stress can't be that trigger for, for some type of genetic expression. So um, I think, you know, it, it is very, very important. To, and I, when I say stress, I mean stress in the sense of psychosocial issues, trauma, whatever it may be. It's so very important to get all of those things manage. Like my suggestion is not that you're ever going to eliminate that. Every you have stress, mm-hmm. I've got stress. You need some. Yeah, I, I mean, exactly. The stress curve shows us that if you have none, that's actually just as bad as having too much. Uh, but you do need to find that happy space where you can have it and manage it. Um, and you know, if you feel like you're getting on the other end of the spectrum where you're having way too much, then you need to figure out why that's happening. And once you can figure out why that's happening, you, you need to kind of make the changes. People, a lot of people don't make the changes, and that's kind of the definition of insanity, right? Mm. You do the same thing over and over again, and you expect a different result. And it's, you know, people's relationships, they're just stuck in things that they know are bad. Um, you know, not to get into the psychological, I'm not right. a relationship counselor, but it, it is a very, very important aspect of uh, of pain management is understanding the person's, thinking and social relationships. Pain management is uh, is what we do in that regard. Your calls 416-870-6400 star 640 on your cell 1130 Dr. Pain Show Global News Radio 640 Toronto. It is 11:32 on Saturday Dr. Pain Show 416-870-6400 star 640 on cell. Get that uh, assessment, get that consultation happening. Phone call one eight five 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 Doctor Lou D R L O U or info at paincarecanada.com. That's really where it starts, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it doesn't hurt to give me a call and try to see. And again, I, I've made this clear numerous times on the show. If you call me and I think you're already on the right track with whatever it is that you're doing, uh, I'm just simply going to suggest that you continue going down sure. that that path. Equally so, if there's things that I don't deal with, like the eye issue. Um, I'm going to be very, very honest and uh, and tell you that I don't that I don't deal with those and and still at least try to guide you similar to I did uh, with that call, caller where maybe continue to follow up with those people. One thing that I find that's really interesting is people are always I, I just find people are so afraid to ask their doctors or whoever their healthcare professionals are, these questions that they have in mind. You know, they they think, oh, I'll just Google it or I'll go do stuff or in this type of forum because they see um, uh, that we have a radio show, they give us a call and they ask these questions. But I would encourage everybody, if you have questions, you know, make sure that you call, you speak to your, your healthcare professional, whoever it is that may be recommending something or, or, um, or, you know, telling you something, but it's, it's just really, really important. Get to a uh, phone call, 416-870-6400, star 640 on cell. Uh, Kunle, how are you? I'm good. How you doing? Good, man. What's going on with you? Uh, so I got, uh, I mean, my early 30s. So recently I got diagnosed with uh, osteochondritis. Okay. Man, and um, I've always had it ever since I was probably six. Right. Um, but uh, recently I started seeing a doctor because it was getting really bad. Um, it was locking up. Uh, so I've been, I had a bit of inflammation. So I, I was just um, prescribed uh, Maloxicam okay. for the inflammation. Um, so my, the doctor I'm seeing was saying um, using the Maloxicam and a bit of a therapy might fix it or maybe I might need to do a surgery, but I need to go see a, a specialist. So I was just wondering, uh, using the Maloxicam and the therapy, is that possible to fix such issue? Maybe. I mean, it's it, it, your knee is locking up now? It locks up a lot, um, especially if I'm driving for a bit and I get up. Um, mm-hmm. It just tightens up. Now, tightens up or locks up? It, it locks up, and then usually when I get it going, it, it just it's very tight to just the range of motion is very, um, very and, and how old are you? I'm 33. Yeah, so, I mean... I think definitely it's worth taking a look at in terms of if if this is something that surgery is needed for, I, w- I would say that you just do the surgery versus trying the other things. Because, I mean, when we've had Dr. Bergava and Dr. Gordon, who are two knee specialists on our show, they, they've told us that, you know, um, 
when it comes to locking, there's definitely it provides a sense of urgency, right? Because your leash, your knee shouldn't be locking up. It would suggest that there's something in there, something maybe going on. Um, and so I do think it's potentially important uh, to just make sure that, you know, wh- why exactly is it is it locking up? And I mean that maybe in terms of doing a good physical exam on it, mm-hmm. checking it out from that perspective, and also maybe have you had any imaging studies? Yeah, I did um, MRI, and I think you said there was probably some um, chipped off cartilage. Some loose bodies? Yeah, oh, okay. Cartilage and stuff. Cartilage. But it's for both knees, actually. You have that in both knees? Both knees, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I think the best route is is give me a call. We can do an assessment on it um, okay. and, and, you know, just get you managed the right way. Because if you – I mean, I'm – I'm of of I'm a believer that if I believe that therapy and more conservative ish, therapies like medicine and physiotherapy and things like that will help your issue, I'll make that recommendation. Uh, but it, sometimes I see things where it's just like, hey, I think your best option is some type of surgery. Then I'll equally make that recommendation. But uh, you know, it, having said that, working so closely with Dr. Gordon and Dr. Bergav, I can refer you to them to um, get you seen relatively quickly and uh, and just see what's going on. Okay, sounds good. Okay, Okay, thanks, Kunle. Appreciate that. Uh, For you as well, 416-870-6400, star 640 on sale right till uh, 12 o'clock, taking your calls. What generally uh, causes a knee to lock up? What does that even mean? Well, Like you physically can't bend the knee? Yeah, so if if something is dislodged in the knee and Mm -hmm. it's getting stuck, that can cause your knee to lock up. Now, it's difficult in the sense that sometimes people think their knee is locking. This is why I have to see people, right? right. Because people will tend to describe something like another. So let me go into this part uh, example. But sometimes people will say locking. But what they really mean is like stiffness or pain that prevents just a certain range. But we're talking about true locking, like where your knee is locked up. It's equally so when people will say you know, this area is numb. And I say, well, numb or pins and needles? And and they say, no, well, numb. And it's like, well, true numbness means you can't feel anything. So can you feel stuff? Yeah. Well, then it's not truly numb, right? So there's this type of, or when people will say, you know, my hip hurts. And for us as healthcare professionals, uh, the hip is like, you know, if someone points to the anterior part of like above and to the side of the groin versus a lot of people with the hip side. will point to the low back, yeah, okay. right? Or same, similar with shoulder, they'll say shoulder and we're thinking the glenohumeral joint, but then they're actually pointing to their traps, which is part, I guess, of the shoulder complex, but not what we would quantify as a true shoulder issue. And we're in that sense, we would probably be dealing more with a upper back neck issue. Um and so that's why it's so important uh, with healthcare related things to actually see a patient, right? Because, you know, and, and again, this is nobody's fault. People do their best to describe what yep. they, you know, and they're not anatomy experts. So I don't, it's not like I give them heck for not knowing. I just make sure to teach them after. Uh, but that's why the physical exam is so important because you can start to isolate the things that people are saying uh, and, and try to figure it out. But, you know, a good history makes a big difference. And that's why, you know, I'll ask a lot of questions and really challenge people like what does it feel like at what times and just trying to put the whole puzzle together because that's really, you know, after I'm done talking to someone, I would say on average, I'm usually like 95% certain what may be going on or at least a list of things that it could be. The physical exam, the other testing, um, that's all really to just help rule in and rule out what I was thinking based on the history because – you know what the person is. I there, I had one teacher that used to say, "Listen to the patient because they're telling you their diagnosis," and it's so true because th- those that set of signs, symptoms, and uh, putting it together in a certain way starts to tip you off to okay, this sounds a lot like whatever A diagnosis or B diagnosis. And again, I'll, I'll usually I'm never a hundred percent certain, and we build a list. Even after you've done, you almost can never be a hundred percent certain. You you have to build this list. Um, and try it out with what is most likely, and and if that's not getting better, reassess. Now, obviously, we always try to minimize the being wrong, but it does happen. Sometimes things present a certain way, and you're you know pretty confident that it is this thing based on all the testing, everything, and then it could end up being something else. And I mean, disc herniations are kind of like that because a lot of times they'll just present a simple low back stuff. Yep. And you just start to think like, well, this just really sounds like a simple mechanical low back, like muscles and joints that are stressed. There's no leg symptoms, nothing like that. Um, and then sure enough, within a bit of time, it can progress to that. So I always make sure that when I'm dealing with a neck or a low back issue, 
even if I'm 99% confident that it's just simple, like a simple mechanical structure, I always tell the patient, you know, this could also be a disc issue in its very early stages or what we would call prodromal Um and and just making people aware of that because then there's certain things that you know when I make that recommendation I'll just simply advise them on things to avoid in in the instance that it is that like right. in the low back would be bending and twisting and things like that that uh, are things that should be avoided but it is very very important from a diagnostic standpoint to have a list and and I think it's sort of a red flag when you're dealing with someone who's absolute especially in the absence of like specialized testing to confirm. Or deny that, but anybody who's ever just like, no, it is this. It's like, yeah. well, no one can ever be certain of that just based on history and physical exam. You could be an amazing diagnostician and clinician, and still there's going to be a r- room for error. Still have time for you to call in. Room for that as well. Four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred star six forty on cell. We continue. Doctor Payne Show, Global News Radio six forty Toronto. One eight five 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 Doctor Lou. When the show is not on, anytime info at paincarecanada.com. You still have time to uh, call in here and ask your questions on the air. Get some answers. Four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred star six forty on sale twice so far uh, this morning. You mentioned PRP. Yeah, and and actually we've had a number of calls just related to knee issues. So yeah. I think you know I want to highlight again that we have our our knee clinic initiative where if you give me a call. Um, and we speak for a little bit, there's certain symptoms that people can have that will go through a questionnaire. And essentially, depending on how you score on that questionnaire, you may be uh, a candidate to be immediately referred to a surgeon. And and that that those questions are essentially a, an algorithm to try to figure out if someone is a surgical candidate. Because as we've spoken about before, if you are delaying that surgery, is just simply delaying your prognosis. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're trying to get people in as quickly as possible. Now, equally so, if you're a sufferer of knee pain and like something chronic, 10 years, like you've been hearing and you've tried all types of things. And we're talking specifically about PRP, the um, injections are used for a lot of different things. Okay. We have really tried to focus in on knee osteoarthritis because we have good research to back it up. We don't have good research to back up the other areas that PRP is used for. Um, And when I say we, I mean myself, Dr. Gordon, and and Dr. Bergava. So, you know, that doesn't mean we've had people that have a shoulder issue and, you know, we think, okay, maybe PRP might be able to help with that. And we go through it with them. But, I mean, when I speak about things on the air, I want to try to be as evidence-based as possible. And there is really good research that PRP is very helpful for people suffering from osteoarthritis that's mild to moderate. So we went through this where if you've got very severe knee OA and you are like you literally need a, a knee replacement like tomorrow urgently, then PRP is no. likely not going to provide much of a benefit. However, if you have that mild to moderate and you're it's more a matter of pain and inflammation that you're dealing with, the PRP actually ends up being really good and the research really supports it. And I mean, we've had Dr. Gordon and Dr. Bergava who anytime you think knee and you think injection, what are you thinking? People always talk about what? Cortisone, right? Yeah. It's always, I got a cortisone injection. And didn't do anything. Didn't do anything. And, and Dr. Gordon's reviewed the literature, and sure enough, he finds that there's actually good research to suggest you should not have a cortisone right. injection because it's not really doing much. So, um, you know, if, if you're suffering from knee pain and you've tried multiple things but you haven't tried PRP, Give us a call. The The other thing is Dr. Gordon and Dr. Bergava, who are knee specialists, are the ones doing this stuff, yes. right? Which is, that's a big deal uh, because they know knees. Um, and you're not getting just anybody who specializes kind of a little bit in everything. You're getting guys that are, you know, literally, this is their bread and butter. They only deal with knees. Now, is, Dr. Bergava also deals with shoulders as what well. What does it stand for, PRP? Uh, platelet-rich plasma. So okay. essentially what you're doing is you're taking someone's blood. Their own blood. Their own blood, yes. You're taking it out. You're putting it through a centrifuge. Uh, in doing so, you're trying to separate the components of blood. One of the components being the platelets, mm-hmm. um, which are kind of the things that I guess would help scab formation. Not I guess, I know that, but I'm just trying to figure out how to explain it. Those things are are really found to be beneficial in terms of fighting inflammation. So once you inject it into the knee, there's all the inflammatory markers that are happening in a knee that has osteoarthritis. That 
platelet um, is, it, or those platelets are essentially fighting off those those inflammatory markers, diminishing inflammation, and in doing so, minimizing the person's pain. Because people nice. with OA that have pain likely have it because there's just so much inflammation going on in the knee. Four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred star six forty on cell. Got uh, Frank on the line. Hi, Franka. Hi. Um, uh, hi, doctor. Hi. Uh, the reason for my call is I was just listening to the radio. Um, I I also have uh, problems with uh, both my knees. Twenty two years ago, I hurt my right knee. I did have arthroscope surgery done and physiotherapy, but that didn't work. And I was told that eventually I would need a knee replacement. Okay. Unfortunately, last year I happened to slip at home and I damaged my um, left knee. I do have in both knees osteo osteo arthritis. Arthritis, and uh, I was seen for, uh, from a surgeon. Um, and he said to me, um, on, on my left knee, uh, to wear a support, um, brace. The support brace was done, but it didn't fit me properly, so I can't wear that. To not let the knee go crooked. I'm only 55 years old. Um, I am suffering from excruciating pain. I'm limited to do stuff. Uh, also, my back has been bothering me and my hips are bothering me. I do take, um, either an Advil or an extra strength Tylenol. Um, not so much, uh, the prescribed anti-inflammatory, uh, pills. What would you suggest in my case to do the surgery? Because I was told that it may not last 15 years. And since I'm only 55 years old, um, I really don't want to go through the process of going through surgery yet. If you were in my situation, what would you recommend? Yeah, so I mean, I can't, I can't tell you what to do because I haven't assessed you. What I can tell you is it's kind of a perfect segue to what we were just speaking of with the PRP injections. So that's kind of why a lot of the people that we see are people who are likely going to need knee replacements, mm-hmm. uh, but are in a similar situation to you where they're just too young. Now, remember, the only... like. It's your choice to do the knee replacement. So the surgeon can recommend, hey, you'll likely need another one because you're only 55. But if you need it and you need it, then that becomes your choice. Now, having said that, I do agree with the sense that if you can delay things, Mm -hmm. that's probably a a, a smart idea because I think the stat is that 84% of knees that are replaced need to be replaced again within 15 years. Mm -hmm. Um, And so basically... We need to try to figure out if you fall within the mild to moderate osteoarthritis. It's not yet full bone on bone, extremely severe. It is bone on bone. They said it's rubbing. Yeah, and again, we need to quantify that okay. based on X-rays. Everyone says it's bone on bone because that's what osteoarthritis is. But to what degree is that happening is what becomes important. Mm-hmm. But then maybe a PRP injection is something to consider. On uh, uh, my right knee, twenty-two years ago, I did have I had the cortisone, and that didn't work. I also had another injection. I believe it was the Duralane. It was okay. over five hundred dollars. That didn't work. Last Friday, I went to the hospital to see the the knee surgeon for the left knee now. He did a cortisone injection, and that didn't work, not even on my left knee. Again, your perfect segue to everything I said prior to your call. Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't doesn't work. And again, you know... I think come see me. Let's we'll we'll take new X-rays just to assess it. Um, and if it is osteoarthritis, we'll see what we can do from that. Good call, Frank. And that number one eight five 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 Doctor Lou D R L O U info at paincarecanada dot com. Back to your phone calls in the last few moments of the show, the Doctor Pain Show, Global News Radio six forty Toronto. It is eleven fifty five. We'll get to your calls here before we wrap for another week. You got uh, Al on the line. Hey Al, thanks for calling in. How are you? Hey, not too bad. How are you? Good, brother. What's uh, what's going on with you? Oh, uh, man. Okay. I'll make it short and sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, over the last, uh, I would say, three years, uh, I've developed uh, numbness, tingling, uh, feeling, uh, loss of use, weakness in my right hand. Okay. Uh, I've been to three neurologists. I've had three MRIs. Um, all I'm getting from the neurologist is, well, maybe it's carpal tunnel, maybe it's not, maybe it's a pinched nerve in your neck, maybe it's not. No one is giving me any straight answers or even 
advising any sort of treatment for it, and I am so terribly frustrated. Um, I have actually lost faith in conventional medicine, to be quite honest with you, as a result of this. Now, uh, the first MRI I had was a year ago, Um, and I never really got... I never really got any answers other than they, uh, uh, I've got uh, some minor spinal stenosis. Um, but all three neurologists have told me that that has got nothing to do with what's going on in my arm. So my problem I'm having right now, I'm right-handed. Um, I can't even live a coffee, a coffee cup anymore. I'm constantly dropping things. And also I have Hashimoto's. Okay. Uh, and that's basically it all wrapped up in a nutshell. Well, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned that thyroid issues can yeah. lead to numbness and tingling. Now, would it necessarily just be, you know, in the right hand? No, it maybe would be a little more widespread. Uh, but, you know, that's a, that's an important comorbidity uh, to consider with something like this. Right. I mean, a neurologist's job, I guess, sometimes, how can I phrase this? They They got to look for the stuff that they can treat, essentially. And when... It's really up to the the family doctor to go to the next point. Um, I would say it's simple. Just come see me. If there's something that can be done or some treatment that could be recommended, we'll make that recommendation. Like nobody's going to walk out of the office with with not knowing what they could be doing. There's always something that you could be doing, whether it's going to make a massive effect or a small effect. There is something that everyone could be doing with this type of symptom. Um, I think it's good that you've seen the neurologist because they've, it, in in doing so, you've likely ruled out all the more serious causes of something like that. Now, you know, I've if you've got three of them, not just one of them. Yeah, I've exactly. Them. Which okay. is yeah, again, which is good because that means likely anything serious has been ruled out, which is very, yeah. very important. Which leaves yeah. us more with the low level stuff, which is you know kind of where we really do our best treatment, like my team. Um, and so, you know, just, it's very simple. Give us a call. It's, it's clearly, it could be anything, right? It could be something in the neck. It could be something somewhere along the nerve. It could be in the hand. It could be a combination of things. It could be based on different positions. So it only is aggravated at certain times. There's so many different things, but it's important to check all of those things. Um, and when I was with my neurologist, all three of them, I mentioned to them that sometimes I have a bit of a tingling in my right shoulder and that a couple of years ago I used to have some pretty serious shoulder issues. Uh, not not really nerve issues. It was more like muscle issues. I'd wake up in the morning and my sh- my right shoulder was just in such pain. Now that magically has disappeared. But it seems like what's happened is is it's moved down my arm and into my hand. I don't yeah. know if that's so, possible. No, but. yeah, and that's what I mean. Like, if they're taking an MRI, the MRI is looking for disc herniation, stenosis, yeah. but it could be just a strained mu- muscle somewhere or a tight muscle putting pressure right. on that. Like, I, I've seen hundreds of people with this type of stuff, and it ends up being something very low level, some muscle that's tight, and you just get the therapy for it, and there's tremendous relief. Now, does that mean it never comes back? No, likely it's probably tight or uh, and hypertonic for a reason, like some type of ADL or some type of work activity. But this is the, exactly why people should be coming to see me. So please come see me, Al. Al, that call, one eight five 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 doctor Lou D R L O U and info at paincarecanada.com. Till next time, that'll be next weekend right here. Dr. Pain Show, Global News Radio, 640 Toronto.